wasn't going to read any weird tales tonight, but um, I saw something disturbing on the internet, so I thought that I could counteract that by reading some Kanaki the Ghost Finder by William Hope Hodgson. Uh, sorry if you can't hear me very well. I don't want to sit in the living room. I just want to be out here on the couch, a little bit more cosy. Anyway. Let's begin. So this is Karnaki the Ghost Finder. Uh, it's a book of short stories. And the first story that we're going to be reading is called The Thing Invisible. So sorry, skipping past the introduction because I don't think we need to read that. Get right into it. The Thing Invisible by William Hope Hodgson. Kanaki had just returned to Chain Walk, Chelsea. I was aware of this interesting fact by reason of the curt and quaintly worded postcard which I was rereading, and by which I was requested to present myself at his house not later than seven o'clock on that evening. Mr. Karnaki had, as I and others of his strictly limited circle of friends knew, been away in Kent for the past three weeks, but beyond that we had no knowledge. Karnaki was genially genially secretive and curt, and spoke only when he was ready to speak. When this stage arrived, I and his three other friends, Jessop, Arkwright, and Taylor, would receive a card or a wire asking us to call. Not one of us ever willingly missed, for after a thoroughly sensible little dinner, Karnaki would snuggle down into his big armchair, light his pipe, and wait whilst we arranged ourselves comfortably in our accustomed seats and nooks. Then he would begin to talk. For my part, I said nothing either. I knew the man too well to bother him with questions or the weather, and so took a seat and a cigarette. Presently, the three others turned up, and after that we spent a comfortable and busy hour at dinner. Dinner over, Karnaki snuggled himself down into his great chair, as of... <clears throat> as i have said was his habit filled his pipe and puffed for a while his gaze directed thoughtfully at the fire the rest of us if i may say so express wait no the rest of us if i may say so express it made ourselves cosy each after his own particular manner a minute or so later karnaki began to speak Ignoring my preliminary remark, because you get parched when you read. Mm. Mm. Um. Isn't that right, Teddy? Yeah. Okay. Where was I? A minute or so later, Kanaki began to speak, ignoring my prelim. Pre pre preliminary remarks and going straight to the subject of the story we knew he had to tell. I have just come back from Sir Alfred Jarnock's place at Burton Tree in South Kent, he began, without removing his gaze from the fire. Hmm. Most extraordinary things have been happening down there lately, and Mr. George Jarnock, the eldest son, wired to ask me to run over and see whether I could help to clear matters up a bit. I went. When I got there, I found that they have an old chapel attached to the castle, which has had quite a distinguished reputation for being what is popularly termed haunted. They have been rather proud of this, as I managed to discover until quite lately when something very disagreeable occurred, which served to remind them that family ghosts are not always content, as I might say, to remain purely ornamental. It sounds almost laughable, I know, to hear of a long-respected supernatural phenomenon growing unexpectedly dangerous, and in this case the tale of the haunting was considered as little more than an old myth, except after nightfall, when possibly it became more plausibly seeming. But, however this may be, there is no doubt at all but that what I might term the haunting essence which lived in the place had become suddenly dangerous, deadly dangerous too, 
the old butler being nearly stabbed to death one night in the chapel with a peculiar old dagger. My goodness. It is, in fact, this dagger which is popularly supposed to haunt the chapel. At least there has all been always a story handed down in the family that this dagger would attack any enemy who should dare to venture into the chapel after nightfall. But, of course, this had been taken with just about the same amount of seriousness that people take most ghost tales, that, and that is not usually a worryingly real nature. I mean that most people never quite know how much or how little they believe of matters abhuman or abnormal, and generally they never have an opportunity to learn. And indeed, as you are all aware, I am as big a skeptic concerning the truth of ghost tales as any man you are likely to meet. Only I am what I might term an unprejudiced skeptic. I am not given to either believing or disbelieving things on principle. I have found many idiots... Pr what? No. As I have found many idiots... Mm -hmm. Where am I? Where am I? No, no, no. As I have found, many idiots prone to be, and what is more, some of them not ashamed to boast of the insane fact. I view all reported hauntings as unproven until I have examined into them, and I am bound to admit that ninety-nine cases in a hundred turn out to be sheer bosh and fantasy. But the hundredth, well... If it were not for the hundredth, I should have few stories to tell you, eh? Of course, after the attack on the butler, it became evident that there was at least something in the old story concerning the dagger, and I found everyone in a half-belief that the queer old weapon did really strike the butler, either by the aid of some inherent force, which I found them peculiarly unable to explain, or else in the hand of some invisible thing or monster of the outer world. From considerable experience, I knew that it was much more likely that the butler had been knifed by some vicious and quite material human. Naturally, the first thing to do was to test this probability of human agency, and I set to work to make a pretty drastic examination of the people who knew most about the tragedy. The result of this examination both pleased and surprised me, for it left me with very good reasons for belief that I had come upon one of those extraordinarily rare tales. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, predictive reading. I had come upon one of those extraordinary rare true manifestations of the extrusion of a force from the outside. In more popular phraseology, a genuine case of haunting. These are the facts. On the previous Saturday, no, Sunday evening but one, Sir Alfred Janock's household had attended family service as usual in the chapel. You see, the rector goes over to office, no, officiate, twice each Sunday, after concluding his duties at the public church about three miles away. At the end of the service in the chapel, Sir Alfred Jarnock, his son Mr. George Jarnock, and the rector had stood for a couple of minutes talking, whilst old Ballot, the butler, went round putting out the candles. Suddenly, the rector remembered that he had left his small prayer book on the communion table in the morning. He turned and asked the butler to get it for him before he blew out the ca chancel candles. Now, I have particularly called your attention to this because it is important in that it provides witnesses in a most fortunate manner at an extraordinary moment. You see, the rector's turning to speak to Ballot was naturally, no, had naturally caused both Sir Alfred Jarnock and his son to glance in the direction of the butler, and it was at this identical instant, and whilst all three were looking at him, that the old butler was stabbed there, full in the candlelight, before their eyes. I took the opportunity to call early upon the rector, after I had questioned Mr. George Jarnock, 
who replied to my queries in place of Sir Alfred Jarnock, for the older man was in a nervous and shaken condition as a result of the happening, and his son wished him to avoid dwelling upon the scene as much as possible. The rector's version was clear and vivid, and he had evidently received the astonishment of his life. He pictured to me the whole affair, ballot up at the chapel gate, going for the prayer book, and... Absolutely alone, and then the blow, out of the void, he described it, and the force prodigious, the old man being driven headlong into the body of the chapel. Like the kick of a great horse, the rector said, his benevolent old eyes bright and intense, with the effort he had actually wit with the effort he had actually witnessed in defence of all that he had hitherto believed. Wow, that was a bit florid in, to some extent. When I left him, he went back to the writing which he had put aside when I appeared. I feel sure that he was developing the first unorthodox sermon that he had ever evolved. He was a dear old chap, and I should certainly like to have heard it. <laughs> the last man I visited was the butler. He was, of course, in a frightfully weak and shaken condition, but he could tell me nothing that did not point to there being a power abroad in the chapel. He told the same tale in every minute particle that I had learned from the others. He had been just going up to put out the altar candles and fetch the rector's book when something struck him... Uh, struck him? an enormous blow high up on the left breast, and he was driven headlong into the aisle. Examining the shown... No. Nope. Examining had shown that he had been stabbed by the dagger, of which I will tell you more in a moment, that hung always above the altar. The weapon had entered, fortunately some inches above the heart, just under the collarbone, which had been broken by the stupendous force of the blow, the dagger itself being driven clean through the body and out through the scapula behind. Ew. The poor old fellow could not talk much, and I soon left him, but what he had told me was sufficient to make it unmistakable that no living person had been within yards of him when he was attacked. And, as I knew, this fact was veri veri verified by three capable and responsible witnesses, independent of Ballard himself. Mm, no, I need more. The thing, the thing now was to search the chapel, which is small and certainly, no, extremely old. It is very massively built and entered through only one door, which leads out of the castle itself, and the key of which is kept by Sir Alfred Jarnock, the butler having no duplicate. Okay, two more minutes. The chapel of the cathedral is oblong, and the altar <coughs> is railed off after the usual fashion. There are two tombs in the body of the place, but none in the chapel, which is bare, except for the tall candlesticks and the chalice rail upon which the undraped altar of solid marble, beyond which is the undraped altar of solid marble, upon which stand four small candlesticks, two at each end. Above the altar hangs the wayful dagger. As I had learned it was named, I fancy the term has been taken from an old vellum which describes the dagger and its supposed abnormal properties. I took the dagger down and examined it minutely and with method. The blade is ten inches long, two inch broad at the base, and tapering to a round but sharp point, rather peculiar. It is double-edged. The metal sheath is curious for having a cross piece, which, taken with the fact that the sheath itself is continued three parts up at three parts up the hilt of the dagger, in a most inconvenient fashion, gives it the appearance of a cross. That this is not unintentionally shown by an engraving of the Christ crucified upon one side, whilst upon the other in Latin is the inscription inscription, vengeance is mine, I will repay. A quaint and rather terrible conjunction of ideas. Upon the blade of the dagger is given an old English <laughs> name of water. Is given in old 
English capitals, I watch, I strike. One of the, on the butt of the hilt, there is carved deeply a pentacle, like a, like a, a pentacle, a pentacle. Is that a five-pointed? No, it's a pentagram. What's a pentacle? No, I was right. A pentacle is a five-pointed star. That's very pagan. This is a pretty accurate description of the peculiar old weapon that has had the curious and uncomfortable reputation of being able, either of its own accord or in the hand of something invisible, to strike murderously any enemy of the Jarnock family who may chance to enter the chapel after nightfall. I may tell you here and now that before I left, I had very good reason to put certain doubts behind me, for I tested the deadliness of the thing myself. As you know, however, at this point of my investigation, I was still at that stage where I considered the existence of a supernatural force unproven. In the meanwhile, I treated the chapel drastically, sounding and scrutinizing the walls and floor, dealing with them almost foot by foot, and particularly examining the two tombs. At the end of this search, at the end of this search, I had in a ladder, I had in a ladder, oh, and made a close survey of the groined roof. Groined roof. There's another thing I'm gonna have to look up. I have. Or I'm not even going to say what I can picture. Like, that's just weird. Groined roof. I passed three days in this fashion, and by the evening of the third day, I have proved to my entire satisfaction that there is no place in the whole of that chapel where any living being could have hidden, and so that the only way of ingress and egress to and from the chapel is through the doorway which leads into the castle, the door of which was always kept locked and the key kept by Sir Alfred Jarnock himself, as I have told you. I mean, of course, that this doorway is the only entrance practicable to material people. Well, I think we'll uh, leave it there for now. Hmm, so. Keep looking at myself, I should stop doing that. Um, so yeah, how many pages is this? Okay, so it's, it's a few more. Uh, and here we have a murderous dagger in a chapel. Um, a murderous dagger with pagan symbols on it and some pretty messed up, uh, what do you call them, engravings? I, I don't know. Um, what more could you want, really? What do you think? Do you think it's supernatural? Or do you think it's man-made? And by that I mean, was it a person? Alright. I think this did make me feel a little bit better, which is good. Hey, Daddy. Yeah. Um. Oh, boy. Yeah, what a day. What a night. I've avoided doing many of the things that um, I, I quite possibly should have been doing. Uh, but I mean, you know. Yeah, no, I've, I've avoided doing that. But it's okay, sometimes you just need to avoid things. <sighs> Maybe sometimes you shouldn't have avoided things. Um, before I get carried away, thanks for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed the beginning of this um, <sighs> Karnaki case. Um, yeah. If you think you know where this is going, let me know. And um, I'm pretty sure you don't. I can't really remember where it's going myself. I just remember it's a good story. Okay, um, yeah, so thanks for joining me, and I'll see you for the next installment.